This is Autobiography of Malcolm X, Part 15, and uh, here's the book I'm reading to y'all. Thank you for being here. You know, you guys get to see me in a state where I'm like, I ain't doing my horror. That's just the way it's going to be. <laughs> but thanks for joining. So, um, I was just sort of flipping through this chapter, and it is getting good, y'all. It's going down. Life of a hustler, right? Um, let's see. Let's see how it goes. So when we left off last time, he was talking about um, the women, some some lesbian women who were in Harlem who um, basically were madams, and they serviced white women who wanted to sleep with black men undercover. And so they kind of had a whole whole business doing that. Um, yeah. Eventually, she rented three midtown apartments where a woman customer could meet a Negro by appointment. Her customers recommended her service to their friends. She quit the beauty salon, set up a messenger service as an operating friend, and ran all of her business by telephone. She had also noticed the color preference. I never could substitute in an emergency. She would tell me with a laugh because I was too light. She told me that nearly every white woman in her clientele would specify that they wanted a black one. Sometimes they would say a real one, which meant a black one. No brown Negroes and no red Negroes. The lesbian thought of her messenger service idea because some of her trade wanted the Negroes to come to their homes. At times, carefully arranged by telephone, these women lived in neighborhoods of swank brownstones and exclusive apartments. And exclusive apartment houses with doormen dressed like admirals. But white society never thinks about challenging any Negro in a servant role. In a servant role. Doormen would telephone up and hear, oh yes, yeah, send them right up, James. Service elevators would speed those neatly dressed Negro messenger boys right on up so they could deliver what had been ordered by some of the most privileged white women in Manhattan. The irony is that those white women had no more respect for those Negroes than white men had for the Negro women they had been using since slavery times. And then, in turn, Negroes have no respect for the whites they got into bed with. I know the way I felt about Sophia, who still came to New York whenever I called her. So Sophia, remember, that's his um, kind of white girlfriend, friend, person who recently got married. Okay, oops, I'm messing up the camera here. All right. Um, the West Indian boyfriend of her prof... Oh, no, that's not right. It's no different from what happens in some Americas of America's most top white circles. 20 year, years ago, I saw them nightly with my own eyes. I heard them with my own ears. The hypocritical white man will talk about the Negro's low morals, but who has the world's low, most low, who has the world's lowest morals if not whites? And not only that, but the upper class whites. Recently, details were published about a group of suburban New York City white housewives and mothers operating a professional call girl ring. In some cases, these wives were out prostituting with the agreement, even the cooperation of their husbands, some of whom even waited at home attending to the children. And the customers, to quote the major New York City morning newspaper, some 16 ledgers and books with names of 200 Johns. Many important social, financial, and political figures were seized in that, fri in that Friday night raid. I have also recently... I have also read recently about groups of young white couples who get together. The husbands throw their house keys into a hat. Then, blindfolded, the husbands draw out a key and spend the night with the wife of the key who, the, who it matches. I have never heard of anything like that being done by Negroes, even Negroes who live in the worst ghettos and alleys and gutters. Early one morning in Harlem, a tall, light-skinned Negro wearing a hat and with a woman's stocking down, drawn down over his face, held up a Negro bartender and manager who were counting up the night's receipts. Like most bars in Harlem, Negroes fronted, and a Jew really owned the place. 
To get a license, one had to know someone in the state liquor authority, and Jews working with Jews seemed to have the best SLA contracts. I'm not really sure what SLA contracts means, but I guess we can read the context clues, right? Is this, is this light all right, y'all? My little Ikea light. What, what, what? Okay. I don't know. It's just going to have to be what it is. All right. The black manager hired some Negro hoodlums to go hunting for a hold up for the hold up man, and the man's description caused them to include me among their suspects. About daybreak the same morning, they t- kicked in the door to my apartment. I told them I didn't know a thing about it, and that I hadn't a thing to do with whatever they were talking about. I told them I'd been out of town on my hustle steering until maybe four in the morning, and then I had come straight home to my apartment and gone to bed. The strong-armed thugs were bluffing. Um, they were trying to flush out the man who had done it, and still, they had other us. They and they still had other suspects to check out, and that saved me. I put on my clothes and took a taxi and woke up two people: the madam, then Sammy. I put some money. I had some money, but the madam gave me some more, and I told Sammy I was going to see my brother Philbert in Michigan. I gave Sammy the address so that he could let me know when the things got straightened out. This was the trip to Michigan in the wintertime when I put the congoline. Remember, the congoline is what he calls like his perm, basically, that gives him his conk, that homemade stuff from potatoes and lye and all sorts of other things. Um, I put the congoline on my head. Then I discovered that the bathroom sink's pipes were frozen. To keep the lie from burning up my scalp, I had to scalp. I had to stick my head into a stool and flush and flush and flush to rinse the stuff out. A week passed in frigid Michigan before Sammy's telegram came. Another red Negro had confessed, which enabled me to live in Harlem peacefully again. I didn't go back to steering. I can't remember why I didn't. I imagine I must have felt like staying away from hustling for a while, going to some of the nightclubs at night and narcotizing with my friends anyway I just never went back to the madam's job it was about this time too I remember that I began to be sick I had colds all the time it got to be steady irrit- it got to be a steady irritation always sniffing and wiping my nose all day and all night I stayed so high that I was in the dream world now sometimes I smoked opium with my white friends actors who lived downtown and I smoked more reefers than ever before. I didn't smoke the usual wooden stick match size sticks of marijuana. I was too far gone by now that I smoked it all. Wait, I was so far gone by now that I smoked it almost by the ounce. It's interesting, right? Like, the people who smoke, how much do you smoke? Me um, is saying that an ounce is really far gone. After a while, I worked downtown for a Jew. He liked me just because of something I had managed to do for him. He bought run-down restaurants and bars. Jaime was his name. He would remodel these places, then stage a big gallery opening with banners and spotlights outside. The jam-packed place would be busy and full under the new management sign in the window. This would attract spectators and speculators usually other Jews who were around looking for something to invest money in. Sometimes, even in the week of the opening, Jaime would resell the place at a good profit. Jaime really liked me, and I really liked him. He loved to talk, and I loved to listen. Half of his talk was about Jews and Negroes, Jews who had angelicized their names, were Jaime's favorite hate, spitting and curling his mouth in scorn, He would reel off names of people who had done just this. Some of them were famous names whom most people never thought of as Jews. So I have a story about this one. Um, I have a Jewish associate who is from New York. And in order to kind of save her, her family from, I guess, discrimination, her grandfather changed their last name. And um, I guess it was a, like a, a common thing that happened to change your last name, so you just, you know, so you and your kids and your grandkids won't get um, discriminated against, and so anyway, 
she said she remembers being in high school and like knowing who else had changed their names and who was Jewish and sort of like passing by uh, passing um, as not being Jewish. And uh, she just said she remembers passing by them in the hall and they would try not to look at each other, but they would make quick eye contact. And, um, and basically the, the eye contact was kind of like, don't out me, don't out me. So anyway, she was just sharing that once she became um, an adult in her early 20s when she was in college, she changed her name back, you know, to her Jewish last name that her grandfather had changed. And there was a big family fight about it um, because, yeah, there was just a big family fight about it. And she said she had one, one aunt who held her hand under the table and whispered to her, like, you go, girl, you, you do this. But there was a big fight about her changing her name back. So I'm a, that's what I think of when I read this part. Um, I guess that's what Angelica size their names was. That's my guess, and that's my story. And now we're going to go back to Malcolm X's story because this is about him and not about me. Um, yeah. <clears throat> Red, I'm a Jew and you're black, he would say. These Gentiles don't like either one of us. If the Jew wasn't smarter than the Gentile, he'd get treated worse than your people. Jaime paid me good money while I was with him, sometimes two or three hundred dollars a week. I would have done anything for Jaime. I did do all sorts of things for him, but my main job was transporting bootleg liquor that Jaime supplied, usually to those who spruced up, to those spruced up bars which he had sold to someone. Another fellow and I would drive out to Long Island where a big bootleg whiskey outfit operated. We take with us cartons of empty bond and whiskey bottles that were saved illegally by bars we supplied. Uh, that makes me think about, I don't know if you all heard how old you are, but when we were younger, like um, recycling glass bottles was a thing and you couldn't throw them away. And I just wonder if it started out with sort of the states trying to control liquor consumption like that. I don't know. Um, but it just doesn't seem to be a big thing now. Because I remember you can get five or ten cents for them. And you really weren't allowed to throw them away. Um, so I lost my space because I'm talking about stuff that's not in the book. Loosely related to stuff that's in the book and making accusations and guesses. Okay. We would buy five um, gallon containers of bootleg and funnel it into the bottles, then deliver it according to Jaime's instructions. This or that many crates back to this or that bar. Many people claiming they drank only such and such a brand couldn't tell their only brand their only brand from a pure weak old Long Island bootleg brand. Most ordinary whiskey drinkers are brand chumps like this. On the side with Jaime's approval, I was myself at that time supplying some lesser quantities of bootleg to reputable Harlem bars, as well as to some of the few speakeasies that were still in Harlem. But one weekend on Long Island, something happened involving the State Liquor Authority. One of the New York State's biggest recent scandals has been the exposure of wholesale SLA graft corruption. We'll have to look that up, SLA. If any of you know, please put it in the chat, S dot L dot A. In the bootleg racket I was involved in, Someone high up must have been taken for a real pile, a rumor about some inside tipster spread among Jaime and the others. One day, Jaime didn't show up where he told me to meet him, and I never heard from him again. But I did hear that he was put in the ocean, and I knew that he couldn't swim. So, uh, lots of folks being taken out, right? Like, anyway, this gets good, this chapter, so hold on tight. Up in the Bronx, a Negro held up some Italian racketeers in a floating crack game. I heard about it on the wire. Whoever did it, aside from being a fool, was said to be a tall, light-skinned Negro, masked with a woman's stocking. It has always made me wonder if that bar stick-up had really been solved, or if the wrong man had confessed under beatings. But anyway, the past suspicion of me helped to revive suspicion of me again. Up in Fat Man's Bar on the hill overlooking the polo grounds, I had just gone into a telephone booth. Everyone in the bar all over Harlem, in fact, was drinking up, excited about the news that Branch Rickey, the 
Brooklyn Dodgers owner had just signed Jackie Robinson to play in the major leagues with the Dodgers with the Dodgers' farm team in Montreal, which would place the time to be the fall of 1945. Earlier in the afternoon, I had collected from West Indian Archie for a 50-cent combination bet. He had paid me $300 right out of his pocket. I telephoned Jean Parks. Jean was one of the most beautiful women who had ever lived in Harlem. She once sang with Sarah Vaughn in the Blue Bonnets, a quartet that sang with Earl Hines. For a long time, excuse me, for a long time, Jean and I had enjoyed a standing friendly deal that we'd go out and celebrate when either one of us hit numbers. Since my last hit, Jean had treated me out twice, and we laughed on the phone, glad that now I could treat her out for a night. We arranged to go for it, to a 52nd Street nightclub to hear Billie Holiday, who had been out on the road and was just back to New York. As I hung up, I spotted two lean, tough-looking Pasanos gazing at me, cooped up in the phone booth. I didn't need any intuition, and I had no gun. A cigarette case was the only thing in my pocket. I started easing my hand down into my pocket to try to bluff, and one of them snatched the door open. They were dark, olive, swarthy-featured Italians. I had my hand down into my pocket. Come on outside. We'll hold court, and we'll hold court, one said. At that moment, a cop walked through the front door. The two thugs slipped out. I never in my life had been so glad to see a cop. I was still shaking when I got to the apartment of my friend, Sammy the Pimp. He told me that not long before, West Indian Archie had been there looking for me. Sometimes recalling all of this, I don't know. To tell you the truth, how I'm alive to tell it today. They say God takes care of fools and babies. I've so often thought that Allah was watching over me. Through all of this time of my life, I really was dead mentally. I just didn't know that I was. Anyway, to kill time, Sammy and I sniffed some of his cocaine until the time came to pick up Gene Parks to go down to hear Lady Day. Sammy's having told me about West Indian Archie looking for me didn't mean a thing. Well, not right there. Trapped. Chapter 8. There was a knocking at the door. Sammy lying on his bed in pajamas and a bathrobe called, Who? When, Mr. when West Indian Archie answered, Sammy slid the round, two sided slaving, shaving mirror under his bed with that little bit of cocaine powder or crystals actually was left, and I opened the door. Red, I want my money. A 32-20 is a funny kind of gun. It's bigger than a 32, but it's not as big as a 38. I had faced down some dangerous Negroes, but no one who wasn't really ready to die messed with West Indian Archie. I couldn't believe it. He truly scared me. I was so incredulous at what was happening that it was hard to form words with my brain and my mouth. Man, what's the beef? West Indian Archie said that he thought I was trying something when I told him I'd hit, but he paid me the $300 until he could double-check his written betting slips. And, as he thought, I hadn't combinated the number I'd claim, but I'd combinated another. Man, you're crazy! I talked fast. I'd seen out of the corner of my eye Sammy's hand sleep, easing under his pillow where he kept his Army 45. Archie, smart man as you are supposed to be, You'd pay me somebody... Okay, I'm sorry. Archie, smarter man as you're supposed to be, you'd pay somebody who hadn't hit? The 32-20 moved, and Sammy froze. West Indian Archie told him, I ought to shoot you through the air. And he looked back at me. You don't have my money? I must have shaken my head. I'll give you until 12 o'clock tomorrow. He put his hand behind him and pulled the door shut. He backed out and slammed it. It was a classic hustler, hustler. It was a classic hustler code and passe. The money wasn't the problem. I still had about two hundred dollars of it. Had money been the issue, Sammy could have made up the difference. If it wasn't in his pocket, his woman would have quickly raised it. West Indian Archie himself, for that matter, would have loaned me three hundred dollars if I'd ever asked him. As many thousand dollars of mine as he'd gotten ten percent of. 
Once, in fact, he'd heard that I was broke, and he had looked me up and handed me some money and grunted, stick this in your pocket. The issue was the position which his action had put us both into. For a hustler, in our sidewalk jungle world, face and honor were important. No hustler could have known that he'd been hyped, meaning outsmarted or made a fool of. And worse, a hustler could have never afforded to have it demonstrated that he could be bluffed, that he could be frightened by a threat, or that he lacked nerve. Mm. So here they are, right? It's like nobody can back down. And I wonder what it's about. Um, I guess we'll find out as we read. But so far in the book, um, Malcolm X has had a lot of respect for West Indian Archie and, um, and wouldn't try to hustle him. So I just, I wonder, like, Malcolm has risen too high and and West Indian Archie has to put him in his place. Or, like, I wonder what this is about. I also wonder if maybe this woman that um, Malcolm is hanging out with, uh, West Indian Archie, is interested in. So, who knows? We'll see what happens. All right. Dude, West Indian Archie knew that some young hustlers rose in stature in our world when they somehow hoodwinked older hustlers, then put it on the wire for everyone to hear. He believed that I was trying that. In turn, I knew he would be protecting his stature by broadcasting all over the wire his threat toward me. Because of this cold in my time in Harlem, I personally known a dozen hustlers who threatened, left town disgraced. Once the wire had it, any retreat by either of us was unthinkable. The wire would be awaiting the report of the showdown. I'd also known of the least of at least another dozen showdowns in which one took the dead on arrival ride to the morgue and the other went to prison for manslaughter or the electric chair or murder. So this thing that's going down right now is going to end in um, either either uh, Malcolm leaving town or it's going to end in death. And I just wonder what it's all about. But I guess we'll find out as we read. Sammy let me hold his 32. My guns were at my apartment. I put the 32 in my pocket with my hand on it. I walked out. I couldn't stay out of sight. I had to show up for all of my usual haunts. I was glad that Reginald was out of town. He might have tried protecting me, and I didn't want him shot in the head by West Indian Archie. I stood a while on the corner with my mind confused, the muddled thinking that's characteristic of the addict. Was West Indian Archie, I began to wonder, bluffing a hype on me to make fun of me? Some old hustlers did love to hype younger ones. I knew he wouldn't I knew he wouldn't do it as some would just to pick up three hundred dollars, but everyone was so slick. In this Harlem jungle people would hype their brothers. Numbers runners often had hyped addicts who had hit, who were so drugged that when they challenged they would really they really couldn't be sure if they had played the certain number or not. So yeah, when you're in the hustler world, basically the hustle is about to come back on you at some point, right? And you got to figure out if you're going to fight or be hustled or, or what the dealio is. So let's see what happens. I began to wonder whether West Indian Archie might not be right. Had I really gotten my combination confused? Oh, he, so he's in his head now, right? Had I really gotten my combination confused? I certainly knew the two numbers I played. I knew I told him to combinate only one of them. Had I gotten mixed up about which number? Have you ever been so sure you did something that you never would have thought of it again unless it was brought up again? Then you start trying to mentally confirm and you're only about half sure? It was just about that time for me to go and pick up Gene Parks and go downtown to see Billy at the Onyx Club. So much was swirling in my head. I thought about telephoning her and calling it all off, making some excuse, but I knew that running now was the worst thing I could do. So I went on and picked up Jean at her place. We took a taxi down to 52nd Street, Billy Holiday, and those big photo blow-ups of her were under the lights outside. Inside, the tables were jammed up against the walls, tables about big enough to get two drinks on and four elbows. The Onyx was one of those very little places. Billy and this 
Billy was at the microphone and had just finished a number when she saw Jean and me. Her white gown glittered under the spotlight. Her face had that coppery, Indianish look, and her hair was in that trademark ponytail. For her next number, she did the one song she knew that I always liked so. You don't know what love is until you've had to lose a love you call your own. <laughs> when her set was done, Billy came over to our table. She and Jean, who hadn't seen each other in a long time, hugged each other. Billy sensed something was wrong with me. She knew that I was always high, but she knew me well enough to see that something else was wrong. And she asked in her customary profane language what the matter was with me. And in my own foul vocabulary in those days, I pretended to be without a care. So she let it drop. We had a picture taken by the club photographer that night. The three of us were sitting close together. Ooh, I'd love to see that picture. I wonder if it's out and about. Oh, okay. The three of us were sitting close together. That was the last time I ever saw Lady Day. She's dead. Dope and heartbreak stopped her heart as big as a barn that had that sound and style that no one successfully copies. Lady Day sang the soul of Negroes from the centuries of sorrow and oppression. What a shame that proud, fine black woman never lived where the true greatness of the black race was appreciated. The Onyx Club, in the Onyx Club men's room, I sniffed a little packet of cocaine I had gotten from Sammy. Jean and I, riding back up to Harlem in a cab, decided to have another drink. She had no idea she, what was happening when she suggested one of my main hangouts, excuse me, the bar of the Ma Cherie, of the La Ma Cherie on the corner of 147th Street and St. Nicholas Avenue. I had my gun and the cocaine courage, and I was okay. And by the time we'd have the drink, I was so high that I asked Jean to go ahead and take a cab on home, and she did. And I never saw Jean again either. Like a fool, I didn't leave the bar. I stayed there sitting like a bigger fool with my back to the door, thinking about West Indian Archie. Since that day, I've never sat with my back to a door again, and I never will. Um, but it's a good thing I was then. I'm positive that if I had seen West Indian Archie come in, I'd have shot to kill. The next thing I knew, West Indian Archie was standing before me, cursing me, loud, his gun on me. He was really making this a public point, floor showing for the people. He was really making this a public point, floor showing for the people. He called me foul names. He threatened me. Well, we have to come back and see what happens with this tomorrow, y'all. Um, have a good night. Thank you for joining me. And I'm very interested about uh, what's going to happen and what's this all about, too, because I know he just seemed to uh, have a lot of respect for West Indian Archie. So we shall see. We shall see. We shall see. Okay. Hey, somebody told us what. Um, thank you, Derek. SLA may stand for State Liquor Administration. That makes sense, right? <laughs> um, likely the root of state liquor boards that regulate alcohol consumption. Thanks, y'all.